Hi, welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graven, and our guest today is Mark Noon. He is, among other things, a professional speaker, an executive coach. He's a developer of leaders at a company that he's formed called Leadership 10. Um, before that, uh, Mark is a retired U.S. Air Force. He was a clinical laboratory manager for more than 12 years. Um, that was part of his more than 20 years of service altogether in the Air Force. He is the author of a book called Set Up. Timeless Leadership Skills for Your Success. Um, he is a speaker uh, exclusively available through Executive Speakers Bureau. Um, he was formerly um, with an organization um, called Studer Group that I've also done um, some speaking and some training through. Um, so with that, Mark, thank you for being here on the podcast. How are you? Hey, Mark. It's good to see you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, one thing, other thing I was going to mention, and we'll, we'll talk more about the company, and I'm, I'm going to ask you about the name. We'll, we'll leave that as a teaser. Uh, the website sure. is leadership10.org. Um, right. So before we, we get into that and the other types of work and coaching and things that you do today, Mark, what would you say is your favorite mistake? Favorite mistake? You know, there's so many, and I, I know all your guests probably say the same thing, right? Oh, I've made so many mistakes over the years, but my favorite mistake is the one I've learned actually twice in my transitioning in my career. And that is transitioning from one area that I was so very good at and so very comfortable to a new area when I retired from the military. My favorite mistake is the fact that I thought it was going to be easy. I thought I've got all of these skills and all of these accolades and all of this that I've attained in 20 years of being in the military. And all of a sudden, I transitioned to this civilian world, civilian healthcare, coaching and leading um, other people. Thought I would, it would be a breeze to just walk right in and be on the top of the world. And it certainly wasn't. I fell fast. <laughs> so how, how did you then, uh, you know, how did, how did you discover that was a, a mistake? How far into, was it that first transition out of the Air Force? Yeah, you know, it, it, with the, I, I see this so many times now. I have a lot of friends who have retired from the military, and some of them go right back into working for a military organization or contractor, and it's, it's a pretty easy transition for them because they're kind of in the same environment. They just wear different clothes to work. For me, it was a total different thing, and I thought I'm going to walk into this place. I'm going to start coaching executives in the same way I would coach and, and work with commanders in the military. I thought I would come in with all this knowledge that I've gained over time. I would just walk in and be able to, to just – you know, spit it all out to these organizations. And it was a huge learning curve coming into civilian healthcare, coaching these organizations that I did not have a positional area to be able to coach them well. You know, I'm coming in as the outsider, somebody they don't know, and they're gonna, I'm gonna tell them what they need to do, right? That was kind of my impression, it didn't happen mm -hmm. that way. So I went into this panic mode after about six months of doing this, and it was a hard lesson to learn. So what did that that panic mode, I assume, I, I hope panic mode didn't last too long. I mean, what, what adjustments did you make then in navigating that new environment? Yeah, the panic mode was, you know, I, I was so used to just being able to, to command the environment around me. And I couldn't do that when I got into this role. And after several months, I actually had a, you know, this was a student group at the time. And I had a discussion with uh, my supervisor at the time. And Honest to goodness, I had fallen so fast and so far that within six months, I was this close to losing my job. And so I realized I've got to make some changes. I've got to do something different in the way I approach this. I, I'm spending 80 hours a week, you know, 12, 14, 16 hours a day, sometimes either traveling and or traveling and working, working all weekend, trying to catch up, trying to figure all these things out. And I just had to sit back and go, OK, where what am I doing well? And then look, look to my supervisor and others to help me figure out where the gaps were. And then just sit back and just try to breathe a little bit and rest and be patient, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can only imagine, um, you know, having, having no military um, experience myself, um, to think about the transition from military to um, civilian. One of my previous guests, um, this is going back to episode 37, Monica Bijou, uh, is in the Air Force and still. And one of the things she does is actually provide some career coaching oh, yeah. to people who are getting ready to leave um, the service. When, when I'm, I'm, well, I'll, I'll ask you as a question instead of guessing, were you offered any sort of transition services like that before you left the Air Force? Well, they have that. They have a, yeah. somebody like her who's in that position to help you make that transition 
But I think there's a lot of things that, as I look back now, that didn't happen that probably needed to. And even when I joined Studio Group and then later on Studio Group merged with Huron uh, Healthcare, we had a veterans group that we formed where we knew people who came in who were veterans that started with Huron. We did an orientation with them a little bit differently, trying to help them transition. And I think there's a lot to be said on the civilian side, too, to help military folks transition into their role. Even though healthcare is healthcare, you know, you've been working in healthcare a long time. I've been working in healthcare now almost 30 years. It's a big difference, even from hospital to hospital, but it certainly is from the military uh, healthcare to the civilian world. Yeah, I mean, I've only had the opportunity to maybe in reverse. I've worked in civilian healthcare for 17 years. I've been in a couple of uh, military hospital settings. And in one of those, I won't say where, but uh, the, the, the leadership, the, you know, we'll say commander, it's a, a, a word we don't use in um, civilian right. healthcare. <laughs> but we had essentially the CEO and the C-suite team in this military right. hospital. And they were curious, like I was there to have a meeting and to share some ideas you know, about leadership and continuous mm -hmm. improvement. But they were, they were playing a lot of defense, I noticed, and, and wanting to point out the ways in which they thought military medicine was different and it, it put me in a, a, a challenging position because everything that they laid out is, it sounded familiar to me. They said like, oh, well, you know, a leader here tends to only be in their role for two years. I'm thinking, well, there's a lot of turnover in the executive right. ranks and civilians. So not, not to go on and on about that, but yeah. um, there, there is, I think, that challenge. So maybe I'll, I'll turn it back to you as a question. How do you face that challenge where um, it might be a mistake if somebody it maybe isn't ready to listen to your experience because they think, well, you come from a different place than where I am. And that was the hard transition, I think, is, is I, where I thought it was going to be easy and it wasn't. And there were times in that first six months, especially, I thought, oh, should I have stayed in the military? It was comfortable. I knew my job. I've been doing it for so long. You know, I was, a, mm -hmm. I was an enlisted lab tech and then I finished my degree, got commissioned as an officer, spent 12 years as an officer, you know, to get to that full 20. But what I what, what in the military, you come from a position of authority. A lot of times you come from a position of rank and you walk into this hospital then as a coach or as a, as a new consultant and you don't have that position. You don't have any rank. You don't have any real authority. I mean, you have authority. You have you know credentials in the sense that you've been doing this or you've studied it or you're part of an organization that has it. But you don't walk in with that. And I didn't walk in with that kind of a confidence that I should have, that I was an authority and that I could do that. And so within months, I literally would have these meetings with CEOs and C-suite and, and allowed myself to just kind of get beat down going, geez, I don't really know what I'm doing. Why am I here? You know, and it's that whole thing that happens because we don't come in from a place of confidence. What, what I hear you describing is the difference between like positional authority versus uh, history, um, experience being authoritative as a person, as opposed to saying, well, he's the laboratory director or they're the chief nursing officer with that formal mm -hmm. position. I mean, that seemed like that would be a challenge for somebody, let's say, who was making a leap from they've been a civilian laboratory director and now they've become a consultant working with different organizations. They might be in that same situation. What would your advice for somebody like that be based on your experience? You know, go in with the confidence of what you know. And then also be humble enough to say, you know, there are things I don't know. Here's the world mm -hmm. that I've experienced. Here's what I do know that works. And I brought a lot of military ideas into my coaching and consulting in, in the civilian healthcare world. There were a lot of things that I think we did really well um, because of a more of a structure. And so I was able to bring a lot of structure. Some I went to one organization, started coaching. They literally had no organizational structure. Nobody knew who reported to who. It was yeah. just kind of a flat line. You had the CEO and you had a, a, everybody else. And so you bring that structure in and you come from that position of, of credential and authority and say, here's how this can work. Here's how I saw it work. Here's how we can make these things better. So that's that's really, for me, how I had to do it. But it came that, that moment where I'm almost going to lose my job to realize, oh, my gosh, I have got to do something different here. And fortunately, working for a company like Studio Group at the time um, helped me make that transition a little better. Yeah, so let's let's try to get some resolution to that story then, because you were with Studer Group then for how long? Uh, eight and a half years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, I did, you, and I did a lot of different roles. So here's another thing: is is sometimes you you come in and you transition into something, and and you're a fit, but you're not the perfect fit. You know, it's it's that idea that you hired the right person, 
but maybe they aren't in the right position. And so then they shifted me to a little bit different position. I excelled really well for a long time and then found my, my, you know, wings, so to speak in the speaking world where you and I met, um, you know, sharing that stage and, and, and those opportunities to do leader development and get conferences and which was really something I had looked for for 25 years to go with you. Yeah. Well, and you know, one of the themes on the podcast here is, you know, we, we all make mistakes but the key is learning from them and not repeating the same mistakes over and over. So it sounds like when you, you part of your story here was that you know, you you, fa- you find yourself in a challenging situation, um, you learned, you adjusted, you adapted, which allowed you to move forward. It, it, it was, and it also helped being part of a company that allowed you to do that. And so when as I coach leaders, I talk about that. I say, you know, just because something didn't work out when you hired somebody doesn't necessarily make them a bad hire. Mm-hmm. Just finding the right spot. I mean, I get it. There are some that just aren't a fit, but there was a fit for me in that. And I did that for eight and a half years up until this last uh, uh, November where I transitioned again to a new role. And yeah. we'll talk about that in just a few minutes on how that went as well. Okay, sure. Um, so before we, we talk about that other transition and some other leadership and, and coaching related topics, I, I was wondering, I do want to ask you, you, you used the word command. And for perspective, um, like one of the best mentors I've had in my career was actually was a client. This is going about back about 12 years ago. Um, he was retired Army mm-hmm. medicine, laboratory director. So I think very p- different branch, but very similar, I think, to right. your role. Right. And, you know, I think Jim had a good transition. He was a very effective leader. And, and one thing I learned from him in, in conversations we would have, um, he didn't frame it this way, but I'll say it would have been a mistake on my part to think the military leadership model in military medicine is I bark orders, you follow them. Like he gave me quite an education about how, you know, the, the more empowered participative culture that he was building in that hospital, this children's hospital in Dallas, he said it was like, in a way, it was really more of just an evolution of of what daily life was in military medicine, that this was not the battlefield, um, that it was different conditions than what we might stereotype as quote unquote command and control leadership. So I mean, what what are, what are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, that's a great analysis because people are people. I say that all the time. Military, inside the military, outside the military, people are people. They still respond the same way. What engages employees in the civilian world engages employees in the military. Yes, there is that I said you do kind of thing. And, and it it can make things a little simpler, but you still have to get people to follow. You. I mean, there's still that that element, at least mentally and emotionally, that you say, I would follow that person into battle. And that is truly what you do. And it's not because I have to. It's because I want to. And I think that's the same in civilian world. Right. How can we get people to see the direction that we're going, the vision that we have for, for the organization, the department, and then have them follow us there? Certainly streamlines it, make it a little easier when you have a little bit of rank or a little position, you know, and, and other people are there and they tend to follow you because of that. But they would, I would rather have somebody follow me because they want to follow me than follow me because they have to, right? So in, and that's, that's really interesting. In the military context, it seems like there would be less choice than there is in the private sector. What, what are some of the leadership methods that, lead somebody to say, I want to follow him. Is, is it a matter of enthusiasm that you want to have that level of, yes, I will run through a wall for this leader. I will follow them into battle. What? Yeah, I think you're, you're right on. You know, I looked at it like this. For instance, for me, one of the things I teach a lot is about value and creating value in people. And what do they value? You know, if you were my employee and or you and I work together, I would want to know what's important to you. What, what mm. values do you have? And then I would try to connect to those. When I think about my time in the military, here's a great example is, um, you know, in the military, uh, you have a, a rank and a name. So I would, when I retired, I was Major Noon, right? That's my name. I wasn't Mark. I like my name. I mean, you know, you and I have the same name. We have a very simple name, right? I mean, you can't get much simpler than Mark when it comes to a name. But I like my name. So here's the difference. If a commander came to me and said, Major Noon, I need you to do this, this, or this, I would say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and I would go do that. But when they came to me, as they are allowed to, because they were higher ranking than me, and they said, Mark, would you do this or this? I responded differently. I still said, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, What did what I need to do. But I responded with a different connection. I respond with a different emotion. Mm. I am more engaged at that point in what I'm doing. Now, the outcome is probably going to be the same, but the relationship and the connection is what's totally different. 
So what I hear you saying is if um, a higher officer comes in and addresses you as Mark, is that inviting a little bit more of a collaborative discussion? Are they in a way, and I mean this is a positive, you, you hear sometimes in leadership circles, you talk about lowering yourself to be more of a, a to be more of a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. Is that what was happening? I, I would say it's not lowering, I'd say it's connecting. You know, it's, it's knowing that, and, and maybe they don't even know that I value my name. I value when people use my name. So in, in context of that, I would be very um, quick to use other people's names in conversation when it was appropriate. You know, if you're a first time customer and I say, Mr. Graven, that's, that's okay. But then you say, oh, hey, go ahead and call me Mark. Mm -hmm. I use the name Mark over and over. That's a connection, right? That's a relationship. It's not me coming down to any level or you coming up to any level. It's that connection that builds. And when we have connection as a leader, man, people will follow us and do whatever it is, you know, yeah. that needs to be done. There's a similar dynamic um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, with the title doctor. Like I always yeah. err on the side of, you know, Dr. Smith. And if they say, well, hey, you can, you can yeah. call me... Jane, okay, and I still might err on the side of saying Dr. Smith right. out of um, out of respect. But I'll tell you the the mistake I would make, and I'm trying to remember if I've really made it. Like if I get too casual about it, that time when I say, "Okay, uh, Bill," that's when they're going to say, "It's Dr. Jones." You know? <laughs> like, right. <"Whoa." laughs> right. And we probably all experience, especially if you've worked in a hospital long enough. Eventually, you get to know people well enough that. You're kind of on a first name basis. And we would see that sure. in the military too. And sometimes sure. people become very comfortable, but I, I am the type that want to respect a position, a rank, a title mm -hmm. as much as I can. And mm -hmm. exactly that is at what point do we say, okay, I have to be professional here. I have to be personal here. You know, where's that difference? And, and as long as I think we can do that, I don't think there's anything wrong with that mm -hmm. kind of a connection. But in the right, all of a sudden, a bunch of people come in the room. It's back to Dr. So-and-so versus mm -hmm. Bill or Jane or whoever, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, what happened, and this is more recent than Mark, what happened when you made that other transition into what you're doing now? Yeah, so uh, uh, back in November, I made the transition from Studio Group to forming my own company, pretty much doing a lot of very similar things, not just in healthcare, but branching out into all several different industries. But the transition was different because at this time, one, I, I even though I was making it as a decision myself to, to be able to form my own company, um, the transition was, was different because I had more patience. I wasn't in a panic. I knew what to do. I knew how to move into this. Not that I know everything. Not that I knew how to build sure. a website. No, <laughs> I knew how to do some of these other things when it comes to business, forming an LLC and things like that. But it was less panic because I looked back and I said, what lessons did I learn over that six to eight months after I had transitioned out of the military, what did I learn in how to move forward in things without being in a panic? I mean, I certainly wasn't working 60 or 70 hours a week as I transitioned this time like I did last mm -hmm. time. Sure, the learning curve was a little bit less, but then there were other things I had to learn. And that was it. It's just being patient through the transition, knowing we all transition in life from, from place to place, mm -hmm. level to level, and knowing how to get through that is just being patient. Well, I'm glad you could set that example for um, the audience in terms of learning um, from mistakes, because, again, that's yeah. that's what we're all about here. Well, it is. And, and, you know, do I think that I I mean, I didn't even think about it when I made the transition. It wasn't like I look back. It's just you kind of knew what to do at that point. Hmm. You, you know, it's like you made the mistake years ago, but you didn't think about the mistake at the time. You just kind of went forward and you did things better than you did before. Now is like when you and I talked and we talked about doing this podcast, I got to thinking, Okay, what did I learn? How you know? Now I'm starting to think about. It. I wasn't thinking about it five or six months ago when I started the company, um, but I am seeing that, and I'm seeing, hey, I did some really good things in this last six months to make this transition. Yeah. Well, good. So I, I did want to ask the name Leadership Ten. What's the meaning yeah. behind that? Yeah, that? Everybody asks that question, and it, it, it you know, it, it, we actually just wrote a blog post on our website. Um, what, the ten reasons why we're called Leadership Ten. I won't give you all ten. But one, number one is leadership has 10 letters in it. So we just kind of thought that was a pretty good combination. You probably never counted the number of letters that were in that word before, but that's what I, we did. I had not, and you counted correctly. <laughs> yeah, right. I hope we did because we remember <laughs> yeah, the name now. So. 
But uh, you know, ten is is also the complete number. It's it's a it's a whole number. It represents completeness. It represents wholeness. Um, when you think about a rating scale, everybody rates one to ten. I mean, everybody wants to be a ten, right? Uh, Bo Derek, nineteen seventies, you know, ten. That was the movie. It was that just that kind of a standard of where you want to get to. The other part of that is, and when I talk about wholeness, you know, one of our values is integrity. Integrity, most people look at as honesty, and it is that definitely. But there's also another definition of integrity that's called wholeness. And that definition also goes along with that 10. And leadership 10 for us is how do we make organizations and people truly whole, truly complete? Yeah. So I will link to that blog post in uh, the show notes. And for the listener who does not know Bo Derek, um, they will we'll probably Google that. That's probably, <laughs> as they say, safe for work. If you just <laughs> right. generally Google Bo Derek or Bo Derek <laughs> 10, maybe be a little, I don't, I don't know how careful. Yeah, who knows? Be. Who but knows anymore what uh, considered safe for dep- work? <laughs> depend, uh, so listener can, each listener can uh, determine their, 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 their risk uh, on their, on their own there. But, um, well, cause you know, hospital, it's not just hospitals, um, hotels or different businesses will uh, sometimes aggressively prompt people say oh give us a 10 right make sure uh, you remember we provided excellent service because the word excellent is triggered and tied into um right. these these surveys so um I, I think it's just kind of random aside unrelated to what you were saying sometimes i think that can be a mistake if organizations are a little too aggressive in sort of you know begging for the score as opposed to providing service that would make me want to give a 10. I agree. You know, in my military days, we had a rating scale one to five. And eventually over time, that five became the normal. Like if you did a good job at work, everybody got a five, right? It was like, if you got a four, that was an insult. And the same with getting like a nine or even an eight, you know, we look at an eight, you know, on, a, on some scales and especially in healthcare, an eight doesn't even count in the, the score, right? But a nine and a 10 is all that mm-hmm. counts. Mm-hmm. Is a nine a bad score? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, if I, I probably a lot of places I go and get great service and I give them a nine. I mean, 10 is, wow, my socks off. This was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. And that's exactly why Leadership 10 wants to be that kind of organization. Yeah. So one other question, Mark, Um, thinking back to this is going back now to your first leadership role uh, back in the Air Force. So in in your bio, there's a part of the story I think is interesting. It said that, uh, that you entered this new leadership role lacking the skills and training needed to lead others in his department. And, and I guess that is, to me, a surprising thing to read because I would think the military um, would excel at leadership training, development, building people. Um, what, what, what are some of reflections of um, why, what, how you had to navigate that? As you said, lacking the skills. And maybe that, that's, you weren't completely lacking, but there was, there was some gap. How would you describe that? Yeah, I had more of a gap than lacking. I mean, there certainly were some skills that were there. And, 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 you know, everybody goes through at different levels of your career. You go to these leadership schools, these leadership academies, and, and they truly are great places to learn. But a lot of the learning is practical. It's, it, or sorry, it's, it's principle, it's ideas, it's, but it's not necessarily practical. It's not like we're role playing these things in it. In, we're learning it. People are teaching us. We're writing these notes. We take a test. We pass the test. We say, yep, you've passed leadership school. Move on. And then you get back to your department and you're not in a leadership role maybe at that point. So you don't get to practice it. Or here's what happens sometimes. And this is a rare occasion, but it does happen. Is you come back to your department and and here's what the supervisor will say. Hey, Mark, that was uh, great that you got to go to leadership school and you learn all those things. But that's not how we do it here. Here's how we do it. And so then you learn the real kind of skills that are not necessarily leadership. They're more management. They're more authoritative maybe. Um, so it's that aspect where I say I entered this role without real leadership skill. And so I had to learn on the fly. I mean, not I, I knew the job because I was transitioning from the same area within the hospital laboratory. But now I'm in charge of people and I'm responsible for a budget. I used to know how to spend money. I didn't know how to budget money. That's a whole different world. Mm-hmm. And is that a leadership skill? Part of that's a management skill, but there's leadership things that go into that. How do you have a conversation with somebody who is doing a great job? And then how do you have a conversation with somebody who's not doing a very good job? I, I learned principles for that, but not practically how to apply it. Yeah. And 
I guess then there was a learning curve, as you described, when you came into the civilian world. And, and that's sometimes all what? we can do is just keep, uh, keep learning, keep practicing. Hopefully we're getting mentored and coached and keep getting better. Well, and, and I think that's the whole leadership thing, right, is you've never really fully arrived. I don't care if you're the CEO, you have not arrived when it comes to leadership. But are you better than you were? I hope you are. And I hope you continue to get better. And that's where I think coming in, I'm assuming at some times that, that commanders, my world of military, CEOs in the civilian world, have arrived at that certain point. And I've found that there are so many who have not been fully skilled in some of these, what I would consider very basic leadership elements. Um, and that's that's where coming into the civilian world and having to coach that now, it was a difficult transition because again, you know, I could do it from a military perspective because of a position of authority. Now I'm doing it from a position of, you know, somebody who's coming in as the outsider. Yeah. And, and I've talked to some other guests where, you know, they've talked about how their own struggle helped them become a better coach because they can better relate with people who are struggling. We think of this is going back. This is a more uh, older reference in Bo Derek. Um, uh, Ted Williams, you know, one of the greatest hitters of all time right. in baseball, at least the way I remember some of the story being told when he became a coach, he was not a good hitting instructor because he had just so much skill and talent. Um, it was hard to relate. Like, what do you mean you can't see the spin on that curveball as well as I did? Yeah. Right. Well, and, and we see that in, in I would say football, even we see a lot of players who become coaches in the football world uh, or in other sports, too. And they are not great coaches. They were fantastic players, couldn't become great coaches. And there absolutely is a skill. And I think my military world, I was really, really good at what I did. And I was a good leader at what I did. Coaching it is a different world because you've got to put a different perspective. One of the reasons we started Leadership 10, which we really started um, the organization. I have two partners. I say we. Mm -hmm. um, we officially became an LLC this last fall, but we've been doing this for about two and a half years now. We've been coaching young professionals in our area. And one of my partners says it like this. He said, um, it, it's therapy for us to coach because mm -hmm. we're reliving all of our past mistakes and saying, yeah. don't do this. Here's how you should do it better. Right. And that's really what coaching is, is, is almost a therapy session for those around us. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing in terms of coaching goes in the opposite direction as well. So um, I think of times when, when I lived in San Antonio and I'm still a big fan of uh, the Spurs and Greg Popovich. Greg Popovich did not play in the NBA. He right. did play uh, in college, but, you know, it kind of goes to show um, sometimes a coach, you know, sometimes it's helpful for the coach to have been exactly in that person's shoes. And sometimes a coach can be effective anyway and can have a different perspective and something else that they're bringing to the equation. Right. I think you have to have a knowledge of what the game is, right? I mean, so yeah. Greg Popovich certainly had a knowledge of basketball. He played college, probably played all through high school, probably played since he was five years old. But so you learn that, but it's not necessarily then are you able to take what the skill and translate it to practicality for people. And again, I go back to the military. We, we learned a lot of information, a lot of principles. How do you then coach that practically? And that's what takes a really skilled leader to get Get to be able to coach people beyond what even they think they're capable of doing. And I think Greg Popovich is a great example of somebody who's been able to do that with the Spurs for sure. And coincidentally, it didn't occur to me until after I brought him up, also United States Air Force veteran. Oh, yes. I did not Air know Force. that. He, was, he, he, <laughs> wa he, he um, graduated from the, uh, the Air Force Academy. He played basketball there, I believe. I did not know that. I'll have to look yeah. that up. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that right, makes so maybe, it even better. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. Um, so maybe one one last last question. Um, earlier, I jotted down a phrase that came to mind when you were talking about um, command, and I think you might have also used the word authority. Um, there, there's a Toyota expression that I've learned um, from, from people there, this interesting phrase, lead as if you have no authority. And so I'm curious what your reaction to a sentence like that, lead as if you have no authority. And I'm putting the emphasis on the the, the as if part. But. Yeah, no, I understand that. And, and I think it comes back to humility. Um, mm -hmm. Humility is the, the center, the core for, for everything in leadership. And, and I don't mean necessarily servant leadership. I know we hear that term a lot, but it's just being humble to say, I am an authority, but I don't have to act like I'm an authority. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm talking about. Here's why I know what I'm talking about, but we don't have to necessarily say that we're the authority. You know, we used to coach it like this as student group, even uh, when we would coach organizations about how to introduce yourself and kind of bring that, that confidence to a, to a patient. 
was simply, you know, you don't walk in and go, hey, I'm Mark Noon. I'm the best doctor in this hospital. I'm here to save your life. You know, that's not how you walk in. But you walk in with a confidence and you let people know that you're good at what you do. And when you know, they know you're good at what you do, they tend to, 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 to react more, more effectively. When I think about how, um, you know, even as a leader, employees want to know you're good at being a leader. How do they know you're good at being a leader? Is one, you talk about it and you talk about how you're learning and becoming better and getting better at what you do, right? That's that authority without saying you have authority. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts there. And there, there's one other student group habit, um, this idea of managing up. When you introduce somebody else, Dr. So-and-so is a, a great doctor. You're in really good hands. And um, hopefully right. I, I did a little bit of the same at the beginning here. The, the Mark Noon, you're in, you're in good hands with him as well. <laughs> that's exactly that's, a, that's exactly where that comes from, is, is just letting people know the other person's good or you're good at what you do, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so uh, again, our guest has been uh, Mark Noon. His uh, website is leadership10.org. That's spelled out, T-E-N, leadership10.org. Um, His book, if you want to check it out, um, is called Set Up, Timeless Leadership Skills for Your Success. And I did mean to ask, so just real quick, this, I, I make this mistake sometimes of having too many final questions. Um, when, you, when you use the phrase set up, is this about setting people up to be successful leaders? It is, you know, originally the title was going to be set up to step in, but that was a little tongue twister and the, the, uh, the uh, um, publishers didn't like it. But it's really about this idea, Mark, and I'll use this as kind of my last phrase, I guess, is, you know, in a leadership role, if you've done well in preparing others or done well in preparing yourself for leadership, you're able to step into a new role and not have to step up to it. And that's the key to that phrase. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, 10 out of 10. I'll give you a top box score, as they call it, in healthcare for, <laughs> for being a guest here Thanks, today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, good. Thank, thank you. you.